says welcome more than a hearty welcome. So let's welcome Mike Cavaletto to our speaker. So that's another key piece of information. 
Uh, something Passion talked about a little bit earlier, he talked about the suicide in the veterans uh, in the communities, the world, and that is a very big concern. There, there is quite a few veterans, it's twice the national average of, of uh, veterans committing suicide. Uh, the greatest number of those are coming from the age groups of 18 to 34, and so it's usually our younger generation. Um, one of the key items that they're, they're, as they're learning more about it is their they're determined that PSD is one of the big culprits for that, um, especially with veterans that served in a combat area in, in, uh, in, in the war zone. Um, and if you can think back, it's, it's, it's uh, very difficult for a person um, to take another person's life, to uh, see a fellow soldier or sailor get injured on the battlefield or get killed on the battlefield. Those are memories and visions that veterans of that era, of those of that particular age of combat zone, live with forever. Uh, so they're not really willing to talk about it very much either, too, so they keep that within. Uh, so it adds more to their stress levels, and also the one reason it triggers that higher suicide rate. Um, next area I want to talk about a little bit is one of these, since the veterans a lot of times don't talk about their military careers, um, a lot of times that information of what they did doesn't get passed down to other people, to their, to their families, to their generations, to their children. And so their stories usually go with them. They don't write them down very often. Uh, I personally find that same thing. I don't pass a lot of information to my kids, and I haven't written down anything. And I noticed that with my father, he did the same thing. He had some stories, but he wouldn't pass down a whole lot of information. Veterans as a whole, a lot of times, keep stories within themselves. So if you allow me, I'm going to indulge in a little bit of generations of my family, three different generations of some of our military backgrounds and stories and things that we, we, uh, we encountered. Uh, I like to start off with my grandfather. Um, he served in World War One. He was the, he fought in the uh, four major um, trench warfare battle style conditions in Europe. Uh, very hard um, combat areas. A lot of times the uh, military soldiers were, didn't survive all four of them. Uh, they usually was so, so dangerous to them. Uh, later on, he became a sniper. He was actually an army sniper. Uh, he's, uh, in the, back in those days in World War I, he, uh, he actually had to move around by mules. So he took a mule wherever he went. Um, so he, at the time, they were, he was considered a, uh, how best to put this thing, freelance sniper. His, his particular mission of opportunity was the enemy officers, and he would he describe to me how he determined or how he worked with the enemy officers is usually the, his target opportunities came first thing in the morning, and usually because they're standing still in front of a tree as they're shaving. That's the only time he could to, uh, perform his duty. My uh, grandfather lived to be 102 years old. Uh, my dad, um, in his career, a lot of folks here uh, know my dad. They might have heard some of these stories. Uh, my dad first joined the Army Air Corps. Uh, at the time, at the beginning of World War II, the Air Force did not exist. It wasn't even created branch yet. Uh, so it was all the, the entire air wing was under the Army Corps' jurisdiction. My dad joined the, uh, the uh, uh, Army Air Corps in March of 1942, uh, shortly after World War I uh, started. Um, he first learned how to fly a plane on the old biplanes, the two-winged planes. So he was described how he really enjoyed learning how to fly a biplane. Uh, later, he became a navigator on the B-26 uh, bombers. Uh, he told me a lot of stories of the B-26s. Um, as a bomber, as a navigator, he had to, and, it's, uh, and I actually thought about this for many years, I still find things of his on how he performed that particular task. If you picture it in World War II at that time, there was no calculators, there was no electronics, there was all digital analog type of instruments. So he had to uh, enable to fly or navigate his, his uh, aircraft by using sun fixes, the sun sextants, and night sextants, using the stars and the suns for his the fixes, using slide rovers to figure out everything from wind speeds to fuel consumptions to everything in order to fly a bomber task force to his target in back. Uh, so he had to do a lot of things, so he was always writing notes and how to figure out his mathematical calculations, how to get that task force over, over its target in back. 
And it had it had changed over already during the mission. He said it, the mission never was always the same. Uh, wind speeds would be different, a storm would come up, and he always have to recalculate his numbers right mid flight. So he's always ordered to have to redo that constantly. Uh, see, my uh, my dad he passed the, uh, his last mission uh, was actually um, in uh, the spring of 1942. He was uh, shot down over Italy uh, on one of his bombing runs. And how he described that is that uh, he was, as the bombing run was is uh, being completed, the artillery flak from the anti aircraft from uh, from the ground there actually damaged pretty much destroyed the uh, the uh, B-26 bomber he was in. So as he's parachuting out, he noticed that as he got out of the plane and then as he said he's parachuting down to the ground, he noticed that he was falling a lot faster than the other folks that escaped that aircraft. And he couldn't figure out exactly what was happening, so he actually looks up in his parachute, there was four holes. So he's he's probably descending to the ground a lot quicker. Um, and of course the flak is still going on at the same time. So he uh, sustained quite a few injuries at that time from uh, shrapnel in his arms, his legs, and, and his chest that he still had even until the day he passed the game could take out all the shrapnel. Um, once, he, once he got on the ground, he noticed one thing he would say is that the, the German surgeons uh, did real well in, in, in putting him back together. Um, but then he was shipped off by train to uh, Austria, where he served the rest of uh, his uh, World War II career in the POW camp. Um, so in a lot of stories of his POW days too, uh, how uh, the, uh, the Germans always separated the Allied forces, uh, whether they're American, uh, Canadian, Australian, English, and French, away from the Russians. The Russian prison POWs were treated a whole lot differently than the Americans. Um, so that was, a, that was an interesting story to tell me. Um, he would always, one of the things that the POWs always do is volunteer to be the um, cleanup folks for the army, uh, for the German soldiers after the meals, to the garbage, because it actually would survive off the garbage scraps uh, that the Germans would throw away. Whether it was a piece of cheese or even bones from, a, let's say, a steak, he would actually do, he would pick those back and he would actually cut the bones open just to get the marrow out of the bones. So he would, he would survive on stuff like that, so they didn't feed them very well. Um, See, my dad served in the Korean War. I don't have a whole lot of history of what exactly he did there. Um, one of the things he performed, um, I think it's after the Korean War, uh, the Pentagon actually tasked him with a particular mission to determine if, if the United States was vulnerable by attack from borders. Uh, again, this is a time of radar was not very it was still being developed, it wasn't precise, it wasn't precision like it is nowadays. Uh, so one of the tasks he was given is how to, to, to mock a, a simulated attack on the United States. So what he ended up doing is figuring out how to take a group of bombers, probably 100 or so bombers, and fly them in from the north uh, over the United States. I think he said it was through the Chicago area. But in his calculations, he had to figure out how to stack the different aircrafts at different altitudes but overlap them so they look like a weather front, looked like a cloud coming through on radar. And they had to go at very, the slowest possible speed that they can go to maintain flight. So it didn't look like a storm front coming in from the north, but it actually was a bomber landing coming through Chicago for the radars to be detected early, early detection. So just calculating how to manipulate aircraft to keep, so there's no holes in this cloud to make it look like a weather front is pretty amazing. Um, let's see. One of the things I'll talk about now, and of course, a lot of people don't didn't realize this, didn't know, this, didn't, uh, didn't know my dad as far as his uh, other part of his career in Vietnam. Um, I spent two years in Okinawa in the Philippines, um, but when he passed away, people noticed his obituary thing that he served in the uh, CIA. Uh, I, he, at the time, of course, as a CIA person, he can't talk about anything in his missions. Uh, so I can actually disclose a little bit of information that's unclassified, but just to give you a general idea of what he did, I thought it was sort of amazing. Uh, he actually worked with the pilots uh, in the U-2 spy plane programs and worked with pilots for the SR-2 uh, Blackbirds. And uh, he actually worked with as several different astronauts, but his skill set they brought to teach them was actually surviving techniques, 
how to survive if they got ejected from a plane, how to survive if they landed in the mountains in the snow, or in the desert, in the water, and so forth. Uh, he had an opportunity to work with uh, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, and some of the uh, early uh, Apollo astronauts, and the same basic things, if they had a crash, uh, how to survive on the land. Uh, I didn't realize he, he knew a lot of that stuff, and he was, he'd always drop a little hints and things how he would, how he would uh, pass that information on. For example, he would mention to me like, uh, uh, that is, there was no reason for a person to lack water in the desert. There was always ways of getting water in the desert, whether it's how to um, tap a cactus tree in a certain way to get it to let, let the, uh, the water come out of the cactus. Um, even some of the techniques he, he uses that are still being used today is a lot of the soldiers carry ponchos with them, even in the desert. And so some folks go, why does the, the military guys carry ponchos in the desert? We can actually use a poncho to create a water, the ability to create water. You actually dig a hole in the ground, uh, put a cup in the very bottom of the poncho, or back at the bottom of the hole, put the poncho on top, put a little stone on top of that, and overnight the condensation from the ground would come up and fill up a cup of water. So every day you would have a cup of water in the middle of the desert. So little things like that you can teach the, the, the military folks and so forth. Um, he is a uh, He's, he's done a lot of great things. So that's what he, that's what he did with the, with the CIA program. He's mainly teach other pilots how to survive if they ever got shot down. Uh, for myself, um, I joined the Coast Guard in 1978. Uh, I retired in 2007. Um, a lot of different things I've done. Um, uh, everything I've been, uh, I served aboard two, five different ships, cutters that sail all over the world. A lot of folks don't realize the Coast Guard actually sails all over the world. Uh, so we're, we got to we go to different ports from, uh, let's see, I, uh, uh, I was on two icebreakers, so the opportunity to Antarctica and Arctic Circle. Uh, I see a lot of different things in that area. Um, the uh, drug interdiction, narcotics type evolutions uh, that the Coast Guard does in the international waters, fishery patrols, and so forth. Um, I served as an engineering officer on five different units. Um, half of my career I was uh, active duty enlisted. Uh, then I uh, got my commission and then served out the rest of my years as a commissioned officer. Um, one of the units I really enjoyed the most was called a Pacific Strike Team. We actually worked with the uh, environmental protection agencies on oil spills and hazardous material releases. So uh, all over the world. So I uh, got to, to go and travel to many different places. I uh, actually met my wife on this particular unit. Uh, she's from Casper, Wyoming. And of course, the standing joke whenever the Coast Guard would go to someplace like Wyoming, it's like, son, where are you? You're lost. The coast is west. you got to go that way. <laughs> so they would uh, always get us a hard time about that. Uh, besides veterans, I would also like to, to pass and stress to you that besides the veterans, the family of veterans, the children of veterans, the spouse of veterans, we put a lot of burden on them as our careers in the military um, go forward. Um, and I see with myself, I, with my children, I moved them to seven different schools in my career. So it puts a lot of stress on the children. When a military member retires or leaves service, the families are recognized also. They're actually presented with gifts and plaques and so forth from the armed services in you know, recognition for the service of that spouse and their children and support of the, the military members. Uh, so in closing, I would say uh, thank you, and uh, please keep all the veterans in your, in your, in your lives, and uh, people that you know in your congregations, your homes, your families, co-workers, uh, just keep them in mind. Thank you.